Globechain is the largest and fastest growing ESG reuse marketplace that helps companies become more sustainable, save money, and achieve their ESG and SDG targets. Globechain connects companies from the construction, retail, hospitality, and office sectors with nonprofits, small businesses, and people to redistribute unneeded items, reducing waste from going to landfill. From fixtures and fittings going to thrift stores and being upcycled by fashion students, to construction material being reused to help build schools, items are requested super quickly and help generate impact to local communities. So far, Globechain has diverted over 58 million kilograms of items from landfill, and they've helped over 50 million people across the world, saving them 350 million pounds through reuse. Check them out at globechain.com. Sometimes the most sustainable action we can take is the one that seems the most counterintuitive. Today, I'm speaking with Jack Prouse, the CEO of Cortina Leathers, which is an upholstery leather producer that works with real cow hides. We discuss in this episode why using real leather for upholstery avoids massive amounts of waste, which prevents methane from being released from landfills, and also avoids the use of plastic materials, which contribute to microplastics in the oceans, air, and on land. Hi, Jack. Thank you very much for joining me today. Great to have you on the show. Hi, Daniel. I'm uh, very pleased to be on. Thank you very much for having me. Of course. And so just to uh, to get started, kind of big picture, uh, I'd love to hear basically almost like an elevator pitch of what exactly is Cortina Leathers. Sure, absolutely. Cortina Leathers, we're one of the premier suppliers of upholstery leather uh, globally. We um, We make about half of the leather Ourself, we finish it in in Ohio, and the other half we buy finished in partnership with tanneries in in Italy. And uh, again, we supply it's all upholstery leather, and we supply many different markets from office furniture manufacturers to residential furniture to uh, architects and interior designers for the hospitality industry, such as hotels, restaurants. Um, also high-end residential furniture. Thank you very much. And so I'm conscious that this is the Sustainability Champions podcast. And when I think of leather, the word sustainability doesn't necessarily come to mind first. So, um, but you're saying that, and on your website as well, it says that, that leather is the sustainable choice for upholstery. So how exactly does that work? Absolutely, it's, it's not surprising. That, uh, that you would be shocked uh, to hear me say that leather is sustainable. Um, I think, you know, a big reason for that is there's a, a lack of understanding about the leather industry. Uh, and also there is a lot of misleading information out there. And there are, there are many large industries and groups that spend a lot of money in order to m- mislead people uh, so that people will buy their products instead of leather. So, no one should feel bad about uh, uh, not understanding this or being misled. Uh, it is it is really uh, endemic uh, around the world. But let me explain why I why the data shows and why I believe strongly that leather is the the sustainable choice. Uh, I think first of all, there are a lot of different definitions of sustainability, and I want to clarify what I mean. I'm I'm using pretty much the the dictionary definition of sustainability. Uh, which is that you can provide and use and manufacture a product uh, now and for the foreseeable future forever uh, without exhausting the supply. It has to be a renewable supply and without destroying uh, the planet in the, in the process. Um, and the second thing I will say in terms of leather being the sustainable choice is not that I'm claiming that leather has no impact on on the environment uh, or on the climate. It it does, there's there's no question about that. Um, But um, you have to sit on something. And and I guess the the question is, leather is the sustainable choice compared to what? And and the vast majority of the products that are used, uh, that people choose if they do not choose leather are petroleum derived products. They're either vinyls, which are polyvinyl chloride, or they are called faux leathers, which are polyurethanes, 
and polyesters. Um, and those are all derived by plastics. So if you compare the, the, the plastics to leather all the way through the life cycle, leather is the sustainable choice. Uh, number one, looking at sourcing, it is renewable. Um, that's a little difficult to, to argue uh, because leather is a byproduct. It's an upcycled byproduct of the meat industry. And as long as people are going to eat meat, there will be a supply of, of leather. And leather is obviously a natural product that is grown uh, on the cow. So it is, it is renewable. It's an in it, it will not be exhausted. In comparison, petroleum is, it has a finite supply. And if we use it now, we'll run out eventually and we won't have it for the future. Um, the second step in the process is, is the manufacturing process. Uh, leather certainly uses a lot of waters, uh, a lot of water to, to tan it uh, and uses chemicals. There's no question. But the, and I'm, let me preface this uh, for our whole conversation. I'm talking about modern industrial scale leather making uh, for upholstery leather specifically. Um, I'm not going to make claims about every tannery out there that might be in, in some country that doesn't have environmental regulations. Those people are not making leather for, for upholstery for industrial size. I'm talking about the leather industry that's supplying shoes, automobile uh, upholstery, seating for offices, uh, hotels, all the, all the things that I mentioned uh, for us residential. And when you talk about those tanneries, these are, these are modern, highly regulated tanneries. We're talking about in, in Europe where uh, the environmental regulations are, are very, very strict. And these tanneries um, have completely eradicated hazardous chemicals there are no chemicals that are, that are on the European Union's reach list of harmful or hazardous chemicals, and that is the most stringent requirement uh, in the world. Um, and then the wastewater at the end is treated to such a degree that the water can be released directly into the municipal supply. Um, it's treated down to the you know, parts per billionth, billionth uh, uh, level. So it does have an impact but it is a manageable impact. The water is recycled many, many times um, uh, and it's used before it's even released and, and steps are being taken every day to decrease the carbon impact of those tanneries. The alternative again is, is making plastics. So that is a, a highly chemically intensive process. It uses harsh chemicals that are absolutely on the reach list. Um, you're talking about volatile uh, organic compounds, you're talking about plasticizers and phthalates. You're talking about other things with more letters in it than I can pronounce uh, in the time we have uh, uh, provided. And, and some of that is released into the air. I'm sure there's treatment and things there, but we're not talking about it's either leather or nothing. It's leather or that. Um, and, and it compares favorably. And then you look at the end of life. Uh, leather is, is an organic product that biodegrades. Uh, within 50 years, leather has returned completely to the earth. The number one, alternatively, the number one cause of microplastics in the ocean are plastics used for textiles. Um, and that is, you know, plastics that are used for construction and materials in your, in your building or office largely stay intact. But, but the, the way textiles are used and they're made, you know, stretched into fibers and things like that, they can fray and break down into very small particles that end up in the oceans and last for, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of years and are causing all of our problems. Or they sit in landfills forever. So, you know, leather is the sustainable choice between those two and done correctly by, by, by modern tanneries. Um, it is, it, leather can be ma made and used now and forever in a way that is in concert and, and friendly to, to our planet. Thank you for outlining that. I think, um, first of all, yeah, lots of different uh, points to go through there. So uh, I'd, I'd like to go them go through them one by one because uh, sure. each, each one is worth exploring a little further. So first thing you, you mentioned was about leather being a byproduct of the meat industry. And, and uh, I suppose 
from the point of view of, um, you know, what, what about leather that uh, is made from animals raised specifically for their fur or skin? What is the, you know, how does, how does that, what, what you said fit into the idea that, you know, uh, animals raised specifically for leather production? Sure, absolutely. Uh, what I'm talking about again is upholstery leather, um, and and upholstery leather comes 100% from cows. Uh, technically, it comes from bovine, uh, which includes cows, bulls, steers, heifers, and all the other names. But we'll just call it cows for simplicity' uh, sake. And and no cow is raised for for its hide uh, or for its skin. Um, and and you know, the evidence of that is, is pretty clear. You don't have to be a, a rancher, um, but just to understand the economics, uh, it takes about 1200 to $1,500 uh, to, to raise a, a cow in terms of uh, providing water and food and veterinary care and all of those things. Um, typically the hide is only worth between 10 and $30 uh, maximum. So if anyone were raising a cow for its hide, they would quickly go bankrupt. <laughs> um, it's really all about the meat. It's all about the meat industry. Mm -hmm. um, a, a further evidence that just makes inherent uh, uh, clear sense is that right now between 20 and 30% of hides are not being used to make leather. They're just being disposed in, in landfills. And that's because of the growth of the plastics and the, and the leather substitutes. Uh, and so, if, if those ranchers were raising uh, those cows for their hide, um, then they're, they're seeing everything go to waste. So they're just not. It's really all about the meat. And then really the supply chain for leather, and again, I'm talking upholstery leather and in industrial quantities, starts after that. And then your decision is, do I use this natural organic product to make a beautiful long lasting product or do I throw it in the landfill? We obviously believe that it's better to make a product. If you throw it in the landfill, not only will it just rot there, but then you have to, to make something else uh, in order to, to sit on and, and that's plastic. So um, we, we feel that the, the tanning industry is really unchanged from the earliest humans that hunted for food and then used the skins to make a shelter or their clothing and moccasins. Uh, it's really that same way. It's, as long as people are eating meat, uh, there will be a, a supply of leather and, 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 and hides for leather. Now, to your question about uh, animals that are raised uh, for their skin, that is really, that, that does exist, um, certainly. That is, is really contained to um, smaller items like high-end handbags or very expensive shoes or, or you know, fur coats, if you're talking about minks and things. Um, even if you look at, at things, handbags and shoes that, that look like they are made from a lizard or a, or a snake or a ostrich or things, 95% of those are cow skins that are embossed to have that look. Um, we make a lot of different uh, leathers that, that look like alligators or lizards, but it's all, again, uh, from the from the hides of cows raised for meat, uh, embossed to look like those things. The exotics that are, you know, made in those high end shoes, um, absolutely. You know, I don't know much about that industry whether they use the the meat or not, but I I agree. I think they're raised for their skin. I've never bought a a, a product uh, with with some sort of exotic skin on it. I wouldn't. Um, and, uh, I, I don't agree with that practice. Um, but that's not, that's not upholstery leather. Yeah. Um, the number that you mentioned of 20 to 30%, uh, the number you mentioned of 20 to 30% of hides are just being thrown away. Um, can you just talk a little bit more about that? Cause that, that, that's a huge amount. Um, do you have any more stats around what that means or how that, how that works or, I mean, what that even looks like? Sure. Um, it is, uh, it's a shame really for people in the leather industry. It's a, it's a bit depressing. Um, it's usually around 18 to 20% uh, 
uh, of hives that, that just don't have a home. I mean, um, it, it really used to be that uh, people bought leather uh, for their for their seating, or else the alternatives, you know, were really bad vinyl that cracked and your back would sweat uh, pretty quickly. And there's no way you would want to sit in that chair, you know, for 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 eight or ten hours a day. I'm going to, I'm here to admit, you know, those products have gotten better. The leather substitutes have gotten better. And so more people are buying uh, seating with uh, 3D mesh or the polyurethanes. Um, they feel better. They work better. And as, they, as they've done that, uh, the use of leather has just greatly, greatly declined. And some of it is due to the misunderstanding uh, that's out there where, where people uh, equate leather with the treatment of animals um, and they, they don't feel good about the treatment of animals, and so they don't want to use leather. Again, uh, I understand that. Um, I, you know, I am against the, the poor treatment of animals. Um, many people in the, in the leather industry are, um, and I understand vegetarians and, and vegans, and if you're concerned about animal treatment, by all means, don't eat meat, um, and uh, you're not going to harm the leather industry. Uh, because as we said, there's 30, you know, 20 to 30% of hides being, being wasted. So we could cut out a lot of meat and still have plenty of hides uh, to, to meet the leather demand. But really, as these other products have grown um, and people have selected them, leather use has dropped to where hides are, you know, we, we have far more supply than, than there is demand. Um, it's typically about 18 to 20% of hides that are that are just being landfilled um, during uh, the global pandemic uh, when people were were not shopping and when people were guarding their money uh, and not buying leather it skyrocketed really above 30 percent but it's usually about 18 to 20 percent and the disposal is is a major problem um, a lot of people on ranchers they, they don't know what to do with the hides and some they're digging pits and just shoving the hides in them uh, they're going to landfills. It's it's not a uh, it's not a great thing. Yeah, I mean, I think <clears throat> it sounds to me like at, at the very least the the point that you're making is that these hides are are here regardless of whether we want them or not, right. uh, regardless of of kind of vegan or vegetarian um, yes. beliefs. They're they're here, and and I guess the point that you're making is let's use them or else they will literally just be thrown away. And from an environmental standpoint that kind of waste doesn't make any sense either. That's right, that's right. If you don't use that hide to make leather, there are exactly the same number of cows that are raised. There is exactly the same amount of methane emitted by those cows. There's the, exactly the same uh, treatment of those animals. Those concerns uh, are valid concerns, but they need to be directed at, at the meat industry. Um, the fact is those hides exist and then we have a decision to either use it or 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 waste it um and and use something else mm. and that is exactly the 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 discussion yeah well that's um certainly an eye-opening thought and not one that i think um is necessarily obvious from the, from you know as someone who's not an expert in leather or, or how the how the actual business works of, of course we're talking about upholstery leather that's mass produced um to to be clear um but yeah that to me is i didn't understand it before i got in, into the leather industry for right. sure <laughs> yeah and uh, so okay so we've we've talked about that part um this, this is a hypothetical question but i'm, I'm just kind of curious now um if the world somehow stopped eating meat, and I recognize that there is quite a lot of margin here, um, but if everyone just decided, you know what, tofu is the best thing in the world, um, and everyone agrees, what would you do? What, what would happen then? I'd find another job. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. No, I, you know, I'm an environmentalist. Um, uh, that is probably a good thing for the planet. And, um, you know, what I tell people is if you have concerns about uh, both, you know, animal rights, animal welfare and the environment, um, uh, don't eat meat um, and buy leather because that is the, the best environmentally uh, thing you do. But if everyone stopped and there would 
uh, there would be no hides, there would be no leather business. And um, in that case, we, we'd find another job, but that's okay. There are plenty of jobs out there. And you know what we have done recently is we've introduced a silicon product um, that I do feel has uh, environmental benefits over the, the plastic. Silicon is, the, is a natural uh, raw material that is the second most um, plentiful um, element uh, in, in the planet Earth. Um, you know, used to make glass and other things like that. Um, and its processing and manufacturing is environmentally um, superior to, to the plastics. So we've launched a plastic. The other thing we're doing is we're looking and, and working closely with some people that are working on developing faux leathers that are, that are based 100% on uh, plant-based materials. Uh, and are better than the, the leather alternatives that are now. Um, and I am very hopeful because there are, there are advancements in these products that in the next year or two, there will be good alternatives uh, to leather. And, and we're going to have them. Um, we're going to, to um, focus on those products. Um, so uh, hopefully we will groan into uh, those markets before leather completely goes away uh, and we'll, we'll be able to continue, but otherwise, um, uh, we'll all go find another job. Well, that, that's, uh, I think that's the answer to me. That makes a lot of sense because yeah, it, it demonstrates, I think that you're, you're really in it for the right reasons of making sure that, um, a, a good product doesn't go to waste. Um, and yeah, I think it, it's clear that this is something that is just available. Um, and so we should take advantage of the fact that it's here. Otherwise it's just going to go sit in the landfill and, and that's a shame for, for multiple reasons. Right. Um, at the beginning, you, you, you outlined several things. So we kind of just talked about the first one about byproduct of the meat industry. The second part, part was the tanning process. Um, so the tanning process uh, is, like you said, it's, uh, it's quite a water and, um, and chemically driven uh, process. So, but you're, you're saying that actually the way it's done is not as bad for the environment as perhaps one would assume. Correct. If, if you look at all the popular images and discussions of tanning, they frequently show, you know, large vats of colored uh, material in the ground and, and people and children walking around barefoot on the edges and pulling uh, hides in and out. Uh, that is not uh, modern tanning. Um, picture instead uh, the tannery we work with in, in Germany. Um, that is just so sustainably uh, focused. Uh, every year they're looking to drive down their, their carbon footprint and they, they recycle and reuse uh, every, uh, everything generated. You know, the, um, uh, one of the steps in the process, for example, is, um, is shaving the leather down to the thickness that can be used for upholstery. And they take those shavings and they burn them and it provides heat uh, to about half the town. Um, uh, and, and so they're, they're constantly looking for ways to, to recycle. They're now able to uh, treat the, the water and, and reuse it and reuse it uh, many, many, many times before anything is, is, is released out. Um, and the chemicals that are used are constantly being refined uh, and substituted uh, for, for less hazardous and less harmful chemicals. And we're finding ways to decrease the amount of water and the amount of um, chemicals uh, used. Um, I mean, I think, you know, the great example is, you know, back in the day, um, 60s and 70s, um, the chrome was used for the tanning and it was, it was hexavalent chrome, uh, which was found to be a, a carcinogen. And when many people think of leather tanning, they go back to, uh, some of the movies and things that you've seen where, um, you know, people lived uh, near an old tannery and, and had uh, medical issues because of that. You know, that the, the use of, of, of Chrome 6, hexavalent Chrome, uh, was abandoned, you know, in the 80s. And, uh, you know, that's just not used anymore. And, and that kind of advancement and improvements, you know, cut across everything. We found recently that by, by, very tightly monitoring the pH uh, of the of of the the solutions 
and the temperature of the water used in the tanning process, we're able to greatly reduce the amount of chemicals that are not taken up into the hide and therefore are left in, in the wastewater. I mean, the idea is, is to get these things, which are, which are liquors and things, into the hide. It's what provides the hide. It's, it's flexibility and, and the, the properties that, that you need. Um, you don't want it left over uh, in the water. You want it all to go into the hide, and, and we're, we're finding better and better ways to, to do that. So the, the wastewater is cleaner and cleaner, and then the amount of chemicals needed is, is, is less and less. Um, so that, that's really what, what the tanneries are focused on, and, and it is, you know, it, it's a process, uh, absolutely, but it's, it's one that's getting better every day and, and, and can be used sustainably. Yeah, and I, if we just compare that, and and this is um, kind of moving to one of the other points that you mentioned, if we just compare that to uh, the way vegan leather is currently being made, um, or or plant based leather, I mean, there are some incredible, uh, you know, I've seen uh, some some pretty amazing uh, materials that are that are being used uh, to create leather, and whether it's pineapple leaves or cactus or um, I can't think of others, but I mean, even those two are just there, unique. There's, there's an apple skin. Right. I've seen, yeah, I've seen that one or, or I believe even oranges maybe. Uh, yeah. Yes. yeah. So, I mean, I, well, the way it sounds to me when I hear pineapple leaves or, or oranges or apples or any of these things is, you know, I think, okay, you gather a bunch of, let's say apple skin after from like you juice a bunch of apples, there's a bunch of apple skins left over. We take those and magically turn it into leather. Um, and it's literally like, if, if I'm not going to be wearing an apple skin leather jacket, I may as well just eat it. And maybe in the summer, that's what I do before I buy a new one for the fall. Um, so how, um, how true is that process of this? And you just said it yourself, you're working on a 100% plant-based materials material, but it's you're saying it's not actually um, 100 plant based usually. Unfortunately, it's not. So don't eat your jacket yet. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you know the goal is is very good, and and anytime you're substituting uh, a man made product for a natural product, and and the apple skins like a hide are a byproduct of the apple industry. They're just there. Let's use them. Right. You know that is a laudable uh, a laudable goal. Uh, and an advancement in environmental sustainability. But unfortunately, um, nobody has been able to figure out how to use these plant-based products solely to make a product that'll work. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, apple skins um, or, and it, let me just separate in that there's sort of a first generation um, of, of items that they take an organic product and it sort of gets mashed up into a pulp. But the problem is that pulp doesn't have strength. Um, I mean, what makes a textile, what makes leather something that has been used for 15,000 years and still is used today is you have this, this unique uh, fibrous celluloid structure that allows both flexibility and strength. Uh, it can be used in anything from, you know, the Roman legions used it to stop arrows uh, and as armor. It can be that strong or it can be as soft as a, as a leather um, a glove, for example. It's that fiber structure that, that you need. And the, the pulpy material of whatever it is, oranges or apples or anything, it just doesn't have that strength. So what they have to do is, it's, a, it's, it's in most cases, and I mean vast majority of cases, it's, it's a layer of, of polyurethane and polyester. And then the organic material is layered on top of that. But it's typically three to 5% of the full thickness is that plant-based material. And, and, and that's it. It's something, but it's, it's still 95% plastic or 98% plastic. A couple of the other materials that you mentioned, the one made from pineapple uh, leaves, or the, the agave one from, from cactus uh, are further advanced. And that's because those pineapple leaves have those strong fibers in it uh, and have a little bit of, of length. Now they're not able to weave the fibers, 
um, but they they do uh, man it down and it has some strength. So they've been able to get up to the best product available today um, is about 30% plant-based, which is far better than 3%, um, but still they need something to provide the strength. And that's a polyester and polyurethane. And so that, um, you know, there was a study that was just, just concluded, um, came out in, in Coatings Magazine, actually. It was a third-party study out of, out of Germany. And they purchased uh, 10 of these uh, leather substitutes. And, and these leather substitutes are, are creatively marketed, which is why there's a lot of misunderstanding out there. They're called vegan leather and faux leather and animal-free leather and fly leather. And, you know, there are a lot of great sounding names. Um, so everyone, you know, believes they're plant-based. Well, these people purchased 10 of these products and tested it to look at the materials. And in every single one, unfortunately, they found volatile organic compounds, phthalates and plasticizers and, and other products that are, that, are, that are, you know, not good. That's the basis. Um, and even in the plant-based material, they're using, they have to use some sort of adhesive and cross linker to get this stuff to, to stick together and to lay down. It's just not there yet. And, and I, you know, I hope it gets there, but it's not there now. So it's, it's just misleading uh, that, that people think they're buying, you know, an apple skin uh, jacket and they can eat it once they're, once they're done, uh, once they're done using it. <laughs> yeah. And I think, I think that's uh it's a, it's very important to, to know these things, you know, that knowledge um, of, I always say, I, I think based on what I've heard a lot, that education is one of the most important things you can do uh, as an individual from the point of view of being sustainable sort of in your daily life. Um, but, and then this kind of knowledge that, that you're sharing is, is crucial to know because it seems like it's easy to, to assume that by trading what one, what you might assume is not sustainable, i.e. leather, in for something that you think is sustainable, like plant-based or vegan or whatever name leather, actually what you're doing is you're um, potentially encouraging a lot more waste um, because that leather will now be thrown away and instead you're opting in for fossil fuels. Uh, and so, yeah, that's um, it's a really interesting point. And I think something that that requires a lot of, um, that, that you know, needs to be brought to light and, and uh, and needs to be shared. So, and perhaps this is um, top secret lab stuff going on, but I mean, what, what you mentioned earlier that you're working on a 100% plant-based material. So that is actually groundbreaking and uh, cutting edge and, and actually a game changer. I hope it's a game changer. Um, I really believe that it is. And, and you know, the material has been uh, produced it just as of yet cannot be produced in industrial quantities. Uh, and that is the focus now. But there's been a lot of money invested and, and a lot of gains made. And, um, you know, even the backing is, is cotton uh, and made from organic uh, cotton farms. Um, and all the material is plant derived. Um, it's not my product. I'm watching it intently. I'm in conversation with the company. Uh, and uh, I hope to be the exclusive distributor of this product uh, to, to our markets. Um, the major investors are, are in the automotive uh, arena that are looking for an alternative to leather and plastic upholstery for automotive. Um, and they've got the big money to invest in developing these things. Uh, and I'm watching it with interest. So I can't tell you that the, the chemical details of how this thing is made, um, but um, uh, it's been tested and, and it is all plant-based. And, and, you know, at that point, uh, we'll, we'll have a different discussion about sustainability um, because that's a real alternative. It's a, it's a real alternative, um, but at the same time, uh, if anything, it'll actually in, increase the amount of waste that's going on with the, uh, with the meat industry as far as what happens at the hides. That's correct. That's correct. If it, if it substitutes for leather, that, that will be correct. Out of curiosity, what was the moment, if there was one, when you realized that actually the leather industry is where I wanted to be and, and where you wanted to be and, and that this is what you wanted to do? 
I actually fell in love with it immediately. Um, uh, on the day I, I was interviewing for the position, actually, uh, we went out into the into the plant and um, just the, the feel of the leather, um, the smell of it, uh, the fact that every single piece of leather is unique. You can see whether the, that cow got an itch and went up to the barbed wire and scratched a little bit uh, here or or had uh, a wart there. I mean, they have the same skin problems that we have. Uh, if they go through the birthing process, they get stretch marks and, and uh, it's just a, it's a unique, organic, natural product. And, and I just love it the way I love, you know, uh, uh, live edge tables and, and seeing uh, a woods uh, grain and knots and, and all the things. Um, it just uh, was attracted to me right away. It's a, it's a product that you have to feel and, and touch and pull and, and the fact that it, it, it ages over time. And, you know, and I had some of the same concerns about, about animal welfare and environmental uh, issues when I went into it as well. And so I asked a lot of questions. And, you know, one of the other things that we haven't touched on today that, that helped me, uh, you know, convince me that it was, it was the right thing to be doing is just how long leather lasts. Um, you know, we make leather for commercial uh, airlines. And you talk about a seat, that is a seat that gets the most wear and tear of, of any seat out there, even more than a task chair um, in, at your desk where you sit in eight hours a day. An airline seat, somebody is in that chair from 5 a.m. until 1 a.m. the next morning, and you're eating and drinking, and, and people are sitting down in jeans on the uh, and squirming around. I mean, they're very abrasive. They use pens on them. Um, <laughs> You know, and 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 leather, we have leather that's out there that is 18 years old on, on these airlines being used every day. If they use uh, a fabric, they typically have to reupholster it every six months. Uh, and if they use a, a polyurethane, it's about every every two years. So that's another aspect we, you know, you know, you need to think about is the amount of sourcing you're you're buying um uh the polyester or the uh, sorry polyurethane you know eight times in the time that you're supplying one one leather seat and mm. and so and you see the leather that that's that old and it just gets more beautiful over time it just it ages gracefully um you know leather will pick up your hand oils if you see an old you know if you picture a uh i don't know a country club or cigar bar or an old legal office from the 1900s and, and the, the leather chair has, you know, darkened on the arms where people's uh, hand oils are rubbed into it. It just gets more beautiful, you know, over time. And, and so I just fell in love with, with leather uh, right away. Yeah, it's a good point. And I think, you know, the point of, of, and I, and I can see the, 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 uniqueness that, that you're referring to. Um, and I think it's a good point in terms of how long does the product last? That's equally important uh, in terms of the life cycle. And, and yeah, uh, we didn't really touch on it, but you know, the, the, it, that also reduces the amount of waste because reupholstering, I mean, if you think about the number of seats in a large plane, it's a lot of, that's a lot of material that has to be thrown out every two years. Right. Uh, and then you have to create it again using more uh, fossil fuels. Right, right. So that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, one question that I'm really interested in, in knowing, so um, I, I, can, I can really see myself being convinced that using leather um, is, a sustain, is the sustainable option and, and a better option than using something that's made out of plastic and fossil fuels. So how would I go about making sure that if I do buy leather that it actually is the type of leather that you're talking about where it's a byproduct of the meat industry it's otherwise going to be thrown away and i'm actually supporting the use of a product um you, you know i'm supporting something that's being used rather than thrown away great question that's a great question and and really this is an area where the leather industry is is only recently really trying to improve in and to make gains. Um, and a lot of it has been driven by um, the, what we call the brands, but consumer brands, things, picture coach and um, I don't know, 
I'm not much of a shopper, but uh, Givenchy and uh, Gucci and, and um, all these people that are selling, you know, $3,000 handbags and things, they're getting pressure directly from the consumers who want to know, you know, at every step in the way was this leather responsibly uh, made. Right. And, you know, there, there just hasn't been uh, up until recently uh, the ability to, to have that assurance. But, but that is, is uh, to a large extent uh, uh, arrived now and is getting better uh, every day. So I think a lot of the advancements in, in the leather industry are, are in that direction. And one thing was the industry came together and created this, this group called the Leather Working Group. Um, and it's run by a laboratory out of the, the United Kingdom. And they created a detailed set of standards for the leather industry. These are people that understand the leather business. Um, there are a lot of certifications out there that test maybe the final product and things like that. But, but this is going into the process. What these people do is they come in and they do an intensive week-long uh, audit, a team of five people of the tannery. And, and each person that does the audit is an expert in one uh, one area of it. It can be the chemicals uh, that are being used, the temperature, the pressure, the wastewater treatment, any, any of those, those things, um, air quality. And they go through every uh, step of the tannery and make sure that they're using the modern best practices. And then there's a new standard that's been created for environmental sustainability. And they come back uh, every year or two years or three years, I, I, I can't remember which, um, and they measure and you have to have reduced your carbon footprint um, all it, it, all time. It's a continual, right. continuous improvement process. Hmm. So the leather working group then certifies tanneries to either um, silver, gold. Um, uh, I think maybe there's a bronze level, but gold is the best. And so um, people can can ask and see, is the tannery I'm getting this leather from Leather Working Group Gold Certified. Um, and that then, if you if it is, then you know and can trust that it's made in a very responsible way using the best possible environmental practices. Hmm. Um, we are we are not a tannery. We we are a finishing house, so we get the leather. It's been tanned, but it's 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 unfinished, and then we apply the the waxes and oils and dyes and protectants on top of it. But our commitment was to only do business with tanneries that are gold certified by the Leather Working Group. And uh, we've moved our supply around uh, to ensure that that is the case. Mm. So that's, that's one way that people can make sure they're supporting uh, responsible uh, tanners that are, that are doing the right thing. Another way that, that we're really making advancement in now is traceability. And, you know, People want to know uh, not just that the leather was tanned correctly, but that, for example, the, the cow was raised in a humane way and very specifically not raised in an uh, area where the rainforest was, was cut down or burned down in order to create cattle grazing land. Um, and, and until very recently, there's been no way to, to tell that. Um, but because of the pressure of some of these brands, and some of the automakers who are buying the, the big volume, um, that now is, is, is happening. So some of the largest providers, uh, some of the largest uh, players in the meat industry, particularly in Brazil, are now instituting practices uh, to ensure that they can certify not one cow was raised on you know, rainforest, rainforest land, and they can certify that through. The other thing they've developed is, is a way to add a DNA dye uh, into the water at the first step of tanning, and that stays all the way through and can be measured literally on the purse or, or, or briefcase that you buy. Wow. And then you know that this hide came from a responsible cattle raiser, um, and the, the animal is humanely treated, and, and that's certified you know, all the way through. It can't be mixed in at one step of the process. Uh, like at a feed lot when everyone was, you know, thrown together um, and you can trace all the way through. So those are some of the advancements 
the the DNA tracing is not widely used yet, but the practices in the meat industry to to certify that the that the cattle was not raised on rainforest land, um, those are those steps have have gone a long way. Uh, JBS, who is the largest meat company in the world and supplies a huge number of hides. Uh, they're based in Brazil, but they're the second largest meat company in the United States as well. They're global, uh, um, huge company. They've invested in satellites so they can actually watch their, uh, the places where they, they get the, their cattle is raised and make sure that the farmers are not cutting down additional uh, additional rainforest. So, so people have felt the pressure finally. And I would encourage folks to put additional pressure on the meat industry to, to make sure that their, their practices are responsible. Um, I think that's a, a perfectly valid thing to do. Yeah, and I, I think um, that and going back to what, what, what we started with, it, it's about the meat industry, not the leather industry, right? So um, uh, it, it really does come down to how the, how the cows are raised for meat and um, right. everything else just follows from that, specifically the, the hides and the leather uh, that comes from it. So yeah, the, I think the technological advancement people um, who are making um decisions on a daily basis and voting with their with their wallets and purses and, and whatever else they use to pay for things apple watches um those are that's where the uh that's where these kind of big decisions are made and yeah sometimes it seems like you know um when you when you pay for something you don't you don't make a big difference but actually you really do right. also just for people to give them some some confidence um, I'll, you know, the large companies that we supply, um, just picture some of the people in the office furniture uh, business, whether it's Steelcase or Hayward or Kimball or All Steel, Gunlock. All of these companies have very strong sustainability and environmental um, uh, requirements. And, you know, they're looking and they are, they are testing our leather uh, every year. They're ensuring that the leather is Leather Working Group Gold certified. Um, and we have to comply and they have to comply with lead standards. So, you know, we test our leather, our leather is certified that, that there are no off gases, there are no volatile organic compounds. We have changed uh, our leather finishing techniques and eliminated all solvents. All of our uh, treatments are 100% water-based. Um, and so there aren't any bad gases or hazardous chemicals being put off uh, on the leather once it's it's, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's made and it's, it's in your office or in your home office. Um, and, and that's a requirement. And every year the requirements get more stringent. So I think people should feel good if they're doing business with a larger reputable company. You know, a lot of these practices um, are, are being assured and, and, and they're in place. Um, if you're buying uh, a hide from a, a bush market in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, you know, I, I can't speak to that. <laughs> but if you're getting a chair from, from a large U.S. manufacturer, that leather is responsibly made. Yeah, what, what are some of the advancements either now or potentially in the future that, it, that can improve leather's environmental stewardship even more beyond what you've already mentioned? Absolutely, and that, that's a great question. There are actually two areas that I'm, I'm really excited about, um, and, and that is switching out uh, tanning agents for uh, completely plant-based options. So there, there are two tanning agents that have been created, uh, or not created, but have been found uh, to work really in the last uh, two years. And one is uh, olive leaves, um, and another is eucalyptus leaves. Nice. In, in both cases, the leaves are not even, the, the trees aren't even grown for their, for their leaves. But rather, in the, in, in the, in the case of olive uh, leaves, they're grown, obviously, for their olives. Mm -hmm. And they actually don't even pick the leaves from the trees. They wait until the leaves fall uh, in autumn. They collect them then. And in the eucalyptus, it's a, it's a byproduct of the papermaking industry um, in, in Central America, uh, Panama specifically. And, and so after you make the paper, you end up with these leaves. And what they found is um, the leaves just soaked in water make a tea-like substance that's a natural uh, tanning agent. 
And so, you know, now we're, we're getting back closer to the tanning process that the Egyptians used when they used to beat hides against the, the bark of trees and tannin is that natural substance. Uh, that, that did not work in an industrial uh, 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 scale. And uh, it also, you know, leather heretofore made with uh, vegetable tannage were, was very firm and dense. Uh, there is vegetable leather out there. It's used in um, horse saddles and straps and tacks. Picture a shoe sole leather, very dense, very strong, very firm. That is the only vegetable tan leather up to now. Mm. But they found with the olive leaves and the eucalyptus leaves, they're able to make a soft leather that is that is very similar um, to to you know chrome tanned, um, but with uh, uh, pure vegetable. So we're very excited about that. We offer both the olive tan leather and the eucalyptus leather uh, right now, and we're looking to to grow that. That's amazing. And then there are, you know, constantly things that we're doing to reduce our carbon footprint just for us, right? Switching out uh, our lighting to LEDs. Uh, we've installed uh, electric car chargers in our parking lot. Nice. Uh, we're recycling more and more, you know, much like, like everybody. We're just trying to do everything, everything we can. Yeah, and I, th I think all those little things matter as well. Um, but the, the idea of this vegetable tanning um, is really cool and and so is that replacing uh the the chrome that you mentioned is that quite a, a a harsh chemical that the vegetable is being vegetables are or the the leaves are replacing the the chrome it's it's not it's not chrome like the chrome six that was that was dangerous right. and and causes cancer and things like that it's trivalent chromium um, and up until now, it's been the only substance that has been found to bind with the leather and then bind with all the things that you want to get into the leather and hold it in the leather that makes the leather soft and flexible and, and have bounce and, and elongate and do all those things. The, 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 uh, but it is, a, it is a mineral. I mean, and, and so, you know, it is something that... Uh, if you can substitute it for a vegetable, then that's an advancement. Mm -hmm. I mean, the good news about chrome is that you're able to remove it in the wastewater treatment process. So it's not, it's not being released out into the environment. Um, and it doesn't turn into the, to the chrome six uh, anymore. It stays in, in the chrome three form. But anytime you can reduce a chemical uh, that you're using and substitute it for something that is right now being wasted, like eucalyptus leaves and olive leaves. Um, that is an advancement. Absolutely. And so um, uh, where can people learn more about Cortina leathers or, um, and, or even try the product? Uh, I mean, how, how would they know if they're buying some form of furniture that it, you know, this, uh, this leather is from Cortina? In many cases, you won't know because the leather is, is private label or it's just uh, on the chair and in, in the lobby of the hotel you go to. Right. Uh, but if it's beautiful, it's probably ours. <laughs> <laughs> no, there are a lot out there. But absolutely, if anyone wants to learn more about us and see the leathers, uh, the best thing to do is come to our website, which is Cortina Leathers with an S uh, dot com. C-O-R-T-I-N-A Leathers with an S dot com. Excellent. Well, um, Jack, thank you so much for your time and for, for going through all of this. I think uh, it, it's fascinating and, and certainly a different way of looking at uh, an industry that I think perhaps gets uh, a lot of negative press and uh, it sounds like it may not be warranted. So uh, based on what you're saying, it, you know, there's a lot of uh, what you're doing is really important because you're reducing a substantial amount of waste that would otherwise just end up in landfill or yeah who knows where and, and it's really a way to encourage the circular economy and an industry the meat industry which is happening um you know whether we like it or not it is happening and there are byproducts that can be used um and you know i suppose if we ever reach a time when when no one's eating meat anymore then uh it's a good thing that you're looking at that 100 percent plant-based leather so you're ready for it for it or maybe i'll go into the podcasting business there you go yeah, well, no, I, 
Daniel, this has been a, a joy and I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I, my only hope is that there be some people that'll learn, learn more and, and be able to make uh, more uh, educated choices. The choice mm -hmm. is yours, um, but I think everyone should have as much information as possible to, to make those choices. I try to do that in my everyday life. Um, and uh, so I hope we've been able to provide some, some useful information to people. Yeah, it certainly has been very useful and uh, best of luck with, with the next steps. And, and yeah, looking forward to, to hearing more about the, the plant-based leather as well, once it's uh, the 100% plant-based leather that you're waiting on as well. I'd love to come back and talk about it. It'd be amazing. Well, Jack, thank you very much uh, for your time again and, and have a great rest of your day and, and we'll talk to you soon. You too. Take care, Daniel. Globechain is the largest and fastest growing ESG reuse marketplace that helps companies become more sustainable, save money, and achieve their ESG and SDG targets. Globechain connects companies from the construction, retail, hospitality, and office sectors with nonprofits, small businesses, and people to redistribute unneeded items, reducing waste from going to landfill. From fixtures and fittings going to thrift stores and being upcycled by fashion students to construction material being reused to help build schools, items are requested super quickly and help generate impact to local communities. So far, Globechain has diverted over 58 million kilograms of items from landfill, and they've helped over 50 million people across the world, saving them 350 million pounds through reuse. Check them out at globechain.com.